الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد So in, in the last lecture we discussed uh, the nature of Allah's uh, words, the Quran and, and the speech and I wanted to clarify something because some brothers approached me during the, the break uh, uh, some, and it, you know, perhaps I didn't express myself clearly with sort of going through the material uh, quickly uh, what I had mentioned was that you know, Allah's, the Quran being Allah's literal words and Allah spoke it does not negate that Jibreel conveyed the Quran to the Prophet uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I mean, there, there's no di- disagreement between the two. In fact, if you look at uh, point number uh, point number 38 in the, in the, in the Aqidah, it says it was sent down uh, with a trustworthy spirit upon the heart of the master, the messengers in a clear Arabic tongue. So, you know, that's the point of the Aqidah. I mean, Allah spoke the Quran and Jibreel heard it from Allah and then Jibreel came and conveyed it to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So, you know, by saying the Quran is Allah's literal words does not negate it, that the fact that it was conveyed to the Prophet sallallahu by Jibreel. Um, so, uh, do we have any qu- uh, questions? Or let's, let me ask a question now. So, can somebody summarize what is our belief concerning Allah's speech and our belief concerning the Quran? Who can summarize that for me? Uh, sentence or two. Yes, uh, okay, but don't speak for me in English, so. <laughs> okay, but, but also more, 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 more basic concerning what we believe concerning Allah's speech, brother. Okay, that's fine. But also that, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks. And he speaks to whomever he w- wills, wants from his creation. He spoke to the Prophet Moses, right? He spoke to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He spoke to the angel Jibreel. Uh, he'll speak to the believers in the Day of Judgment. Okay? And from Allah's speech is the Quran, which is Allah's literal words. Okay, so that, that's the basic you know, belief we want to um, uh, have. And uh, concerning the sciences of the Quran, as I said, I mean... Uh, by Allah's grace, we, I had the opportunity here at San Munteda to uh, give some lectures on the uh, sciences of the Quran, where we discussed the issue of the revelation of the Quran and the seven letters and, and all, all that, what it meant. So you can refer to those uh, tapes uh, uh, for further details. Okay, so now we want to come to the, n- the next lecture, which is uh, regarding the uh, seeing Allah in the hereafter. A part of the belief that we have inherited from the Prophet وسلم, that we have inherited from the Qur'an, uh, is that in the hereafter, as Ibn Qudamah says, the believers will see their Lord by their very eyes. Uh, and then again it says they will visit him, as I mentioned before, that's a part of a weak hadith, so you can cross that out. Uh, he will speak to them and they will speak to him. Uh, Allah Ta'ala has said, um, on that day faces shall be radiant. On, on that day faces will be uh, Radiant, they will be looking uh, to their Lord. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said concerning uh, the unbelievers, uh, kalla, um, that indeed, no indeed, that on that day, regarding their Lord, they will be veiled. And Rabbihim mahjubun, that they will be veiled from Allah azza So if the disbelievers will be veiled, they'll have a hijab, so they will not be able to see Allah. It, it indicates, right, that the believers will be, will be able to see their Lord. Because otherwise, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say as a, as a point of condemnation about the unbelievers that they'll be veiled from Allah? I mean, if the believers are also veiled from seeing Allah, then there would be no difference. So why criticize the kuffar regarding that matter? So that's an indication that, as Ibn Qudamah said, that since Allah veiled those who are in the state of his displeasure from seeing him, it indicated that the faithful who are in the state of his pleasure shall see him. Otherwise, there would have been no difference between them. And the Prophet ﷺ has said, uh, Indeed, you shall see your Lord as you see this moon. And the moon was full. Uh, you will not have to crowd together to see him. And this is an authentic narration uh, reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. The comparison here that the Prophet ﷺ made is in the act of seeing, not in the object seen. For indeed, Allah has no resemblance or similar. So in other words... Um, the, the comparison when the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, verily you shall see your Lord on the day of judgment as you see this moon. Allah, the Prophet ﷺ wasn't trying to say that Allah 
is like the moon. But rather, in the same way that you see the moon clearly during a night when it's full, okay, in the same way you'll see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly. And there are nothing will obscure, you know, your, your seeing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and so that, that is what the, um, the hadith means. And uh, so, so the point of our belief is that, you know, this is something which, uh, you know, we should hold and we should believe that we will see Allah in the hereafter. And in fact, this is the greatest blessing or among the greatest blessings of the hereafter. I mean, to enter into paradise, you know, is, is, a, is a blessing in itself. And to, um, and, and to receive Allah's mercy and, his, and, to be, and for Allah to be pleased with us is a blessing. But, but a blessing which is higher and which is part, which is the fulfillment of that, is to, to, to see Allah, Azawajal, our Lord, and to speak to Allah and to have Allah, you know, speak back to us. And this is, this is the higher, you know, uh, you know uh, blessing. Uh, and that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say in a hadith reported by Ahmed that, you know, I, I, I ask of you a shawq kila liqa'ika that, you know, that, that burning desire to meet you, okay? And I ask of you the blessing of seeing you in the hereafter. Uh, so, to see Allah Azza wa Jal is a great blessing indeed. And, you know, that, and that's all I wanted to discuss about this point of the Aqib, so we have a lot of points. So we can talk about, I mean, um, here the importance of this is outside the Aqidah, but it's beneficial, so we want to I mean, spend some time with it. I mean, the importance of understanding you know, the aim to which we must strive. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافِسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ And regarding that, meaning the hereafter, let those people who, you know, who strive and who, you know, who, who seek to, to win something, let them work towards that. Uh, unfortunately, you know, because of the society we live in, you know, sometimes we, we, we forget our priorities, okay? I mean, you know, in this society, uh, uh, in a capitalistic society like here in the United Kingdom or in the United States, um, the highest value is to be a, a producer and a consumer. And that's the highest societal value, okay? Your worth in society is based on how much you produce and how much you can consume. And you're rewarded for that, okay? That's why if you're on, a, if you're on an airplane and the airplane uh, crashes, right? And, and, and you um, uh, may have a lot of reserves for that. But if you're on an airplane and the airplane you crash, or if you're in a train crash, and they have to, they will, you know, they will dispense money based upon what? Not upon that the fact that, well, you're all human beings and therefore you have the same value, but depending upon your status in society. So if you're a doctor and your income is you know, 100000 or $150,000 a year, you will be awarded, your, your inheritors will be awarded more money, for instance, than if you're a taxi driver and, you, you know, your income is, what, like $12,000 a year. Because the society gauges people upon, upon their value in terms of what they produce, in terms of, you know, in terms of a tangible uh, income and what they consume. And, and this is, and so therefore, you know, Muslims, they get affected by that. And so we start looking at matters from that perspective. And we forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the Qur'an, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِتْقَاقُمْ That the most noble of you with Allah are those who have the most taqwa. It's not how much money you make, you know, it's not your societal status, but it's, it's the piety and the, your, the adherence uh, in your heart and the adherence you have outwardly and inwardly to Allah's sharia. And that's the standard, okay? And because we, in this society, we, we live and this is the message we hear, you know, it's very important that we're reminded as to w always constantly as to what is the aim and what is the goal we need to have in life. And that is that we need to worship Allah and we need to draw closer to Allah. Now the circumstances that we live, the century that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that we're born and we live in, is one in where <coughs> it's an unnatural century in the sense that the, 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 the kuffar have the upper hand, you see. And since the kuffar have the upper hand, you know, the, the political and the economic and the other social systems in the world, I mean, are run by them. So, you know, the standards in the world and so forth, and, and Muslims are, you know, I mean, find themselves in these, you know, uncomfortable situations where they're living under non-Muslims and so forth. But that, that's not the point. The point is, is that we still nonetheless have to, as the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, اتق الله حيث ما كنت. You know, fear Allah wherever you are. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا صَفَعْتُ Fear Allah to the best of your capability. So, how do we then, the question comes, you know, how do we then draw uh, closer to Allah? How, how is it that we become, you know, closer to Allah? How do, we, how do we convert these facts that we're learning into actually, you know, a spiritual state, into actually to acts of worship by which, you know, we are constant upon, so it becomes 
part of us. That, that's the issue. And there's, there's no benefit to, to, to memorize these points and not have the spiritual uh, fruits being born from that. And, and so then, therefore, you know, the, the issue comes, and this is, will be a, a, a summary of my lecture that I'll give um, uh, tomorrow night on, 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 on being impoverished before Allah, Azza wa Jal. But the first step in, tra- in traveling unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't come, you can't come to the lecture uh, <laughs> tomorrow night, but just in case you wouldn't be able to make it. But the first step that uh, one takes unto Allah, Azza wa Jal, uh, is uh, that of being impoverished before Him. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ أَنْتُمُ الْفُقَرَاءِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ وَالْغَنِيُّ الْحَمِيدِ O mankind, O humanity, you are the impoverished unto Allah, and Allah is al-ghani, the one who is without wants, al-hamid, the one who is deserving of all praise and who praises himself. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, you know, informed us of our state, that our state is one of being impoverished before him. And this is our natural state. أَنْتُمُ الْفُقَرَاءِ إِلَى اللَّهِ and the, the, the quality of being impoverished before Allah Azza wa Jal is inseparable from our essence. And just like now we're talking about Allah's attributes, we say that Allah's attributes are inseparable from His essence. So poverty is an, a, is an attribute or a quality which is inseparable from the human condition, from the human existence. The, the human being by its nature is going to be impoverished before Allah Azza wa Jal. And something in, in, in inseparable to Him. When a human being forgets that he is impoverished before Allah Azza wa Jal, then he transgresses. Okay? Uh, who, who knows uh, amongst us uh, Surah Al-Iqra? Huh? I, want, I want to hear the, six, uh, read the first six verses. Yes, you, you raised your hand, right? So, huh? You said you knew it, sorry. <laughs> the, the brothers in Washington, D.C., they, they know not to fall into these tricks, by the way, but the brothers in London need a little experience. So. <laughs> In the next verse? Okay, so this is the point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kalla inna insana layabha. That indeed the human being will make tughiyan, will overstep his bounds. Why? He sees himself self sufficient. In other words, he forgot that he's faqir unto Allah. And, and so when, when human beings forget that they're impoverished before Allah, then they transgress his boundaries. And that's why transgression against Allah Azawajal is greater in this modern age than has been in ever, any other time in human existence. I mean, kuf, you know, I mean, denial of Allah's existence and the flaunting of Allah's commands and transgression against other human beings is more severe in this century, in this modern age. Why? Because human beings find themselves more self-sufficient in this modern age, and they have in, in previous times. I mean, in previous times, when, it was, when your daily existence was difficult, right, and people had to struggle, and life was more precarious, you know, you're on the edge whether you're going to, you know, and so forth, then people, you know, felt, they, they realized their weakness, because they would face it every single day. But now, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened upon us all these bounties and blessings, I mean, you don't have to draw water from a well anymore, you don't have to worry about your daily food, uh, you know, I mean, clothing and uh, of, of, of fine types, of shelter, warmth, you know, to protect you from the cold. And these things are, which, you know, a century ago, a century and a half ago, I mean, people were, were, would struggle with these. These are things are no longer an issue for us, right? We can't imagine, you know what I'm saying? Uh, if, I don't know if you've ever had experienced a blackout, you know what I'm saying? But if you've ever experienced a blackout where the power goes down, I and mean, you find yourself helpless all of a sudden because, you know, it's something which you're, you're not used to, that to be without electricity just for an hour or two. You know, how am I going to survive, you know? So, so, as a result, when human beings, you know, have experienced this, they, therefore they feel self-sufficient. So when they feel self-sufficient, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, as a brother decided for us, may Allah reward him those ayats, right? What does he do? La yafra. He, he oversteps his boundaries, okay? But the, but the point is that we have to remember that we are faqir unto Allah azza wa jal. And impoverishment before Allah Azza wa Jal is of two types. Uh, one form of impoverishment before Allah Azza wa Jal is, is the natural impoverishment, which, which is uh, an aspect of, or, you know, is not separable, let's say, instead of saying an aspect, is, is inseparable of the fact that you are created by Allah Azza wa Jal. 
In other words, because you're created by Allah Azza your existence is dependent upon Allah Azza wa Jalla, and so therefore you're fakir unto Allah Azza wa Jalla. This is not praiseworthy, because in this you and the, and the, and the unbelievers are the same. I mean, there's nothing praiseworthy in that. Uh, in fact, you are the same with that with all living creatures. And also all non-living creatures, all inanimate objects, are all impoverished unto Allah in the sense that Allah brought into existence and keeps his existence. And if Allah was not to keep into existence, it would no longer exist. But then there's another type of impoverishment, which is the impoverishment, which is the voluntary impoverishment that a person takes. And that is when you submit unto Allah, as wa And so therefore, the, first, the person who is the most impoverished before Allah is the person who is the most submitting unto Allah, so therefore the most impoverished person before Allah is, uh, is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And impoverishment before Allah is, does not mean that one is, does not have wealth, as some people expect. Some people think that in order for you to be you know, impoverished before Allah, is, then therefore you need to be poor. You know, and that you need to, you know, have tattered clothes, and you need to, um, you know, have n- no money in your pocket, and, you know, have no food to eat, and, you know, have maybe no home, and, you know, so forth. That doesn't mean that you're impoverished before Allah, Azza Because look at Sulaiman, and look at Dawood, two prophets of Allah, Azza who yet were given, I mean, Sulaiman was given, uh, you know, property and, and, and a dominion which no human being has ever had, and no human being can ever have, and yet he was impoverished before Allah, Azza and yet there might be a person who you know, has no clothes on his back and has no shelter above his head and no food in his belly, and yet he is in his heart among those people who are the most least impoverished in Allah, the most transgressing against Allah. Azza wa Jal. But because Allah didn't decree for him to have the means, his transgression might not appear. But had the means come to his hands, he would have had it. And so therefore, you know, to be impoverished before Allah does not mean that. But impoverishment before Allah uh, requires... In reality, uh, is, is three steps. Okay, the, fir- the first step is to forsake the dunya, to forsake this world, um, in the sense that one does not, when he is given something, he doesn't hold on to it, and at the same time, he doesn't go after the dunya, nor does he praise the dunya, nor does he condemn the dunya, this world. Uh, what does that mean? Well, in the sense that if you, if, if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, if you realize that you are Allah's servant and Allah created you, and whatever comes to you is by Allah's decree then you, you give it, because you know that this is not your property. It's, you are just put as a custodian in charge of it. So you don't hold on to it, you're not stingy to it. And at the same time, you know that, uh, that there's no reason for you to strive to amass it, because even if you were to gain it, Allah could take it away from you. And so therefore, this is not uh, something there. Nor do you praise it or condemn it, because it should not be something which is of importance to you. Uh, and, you know, sometimes people condemn the world and condemn those who are indulging the world, not because that their hearts are free from the passions of this world, but because it is out of jealousy because they have not been given that in this world. And so one has to be careful that when one condemns uh, the world and so forth, that, you know, in general, it's, it's not to be... Care- I mean, if it's like, if it's something which is not important to them. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. Rugby. Rugby is something which to me is, an, I mean, of non, any significance whatsoever. So, you would no, never ever find me either discussing, you know, praising or condemning rugby, because it's just something which doesn't, I mean, enter my mind, because I, to me it's something which is, oh, there's no rugby fans here or something. <laughs> it's something which is, which is not, I mean, of importance whatsoever. So, so like such the world should be with us. We should never, we never can, can, you know, delve into it, because it should be of a non-importance to us, okay? Uh, it is permissible in the Sharia to condemn uh, the... Um, uh, the, uh, the world in, in two cases. When one is uh, among the people who are drawn into the world in order to, uh, you know, to give them guidance to leave it, or if one finds himself being drawn to the glitterings of the world in order to restrain his own soul. Okay? That's the first level. The second level is that when one realizes after he's left the world and forsaken it, he realizes that he did not reach that point had it not been that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him to their point. That had it not been for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would have never reached it. Because sometimes people, when they, when they have given up the, the, the world and, they, and they've turned themselves to Allah azza wa jal, um, they, 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 they see themselves uh, that of some sort of value and so forth. Because they say, you see, oh, I've reached the point. And this is, this is in sort of any sort of religious point. You, know, you see yourself open the sunnah, so you start looking to yourself and saying, oh, you see, you know, I reached it, so therefore you attach some sort of value to that. But in, that's, and that's, and that's a deception from Iblis. Okay, because you should know that you would have nev- never reached that point, right? 
uh, had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not guided you to that point. That we'll come to that next lecture about Qadr. You know, that, you know, that, you know, Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana. Because if had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not guided us, we would have never been guided unto that. So, when one realizes that, then therefore, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't, as, as they say, um, he doesn't witness himself in, in, that, in that spiritual station. But rather, he, 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 he sees himself still uh, that he's uh, deficient and so forth. And you can only reach that uh, if you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, by, his, by his four names. al awwal wal akhir wal zahir wal batin um, and what do those four names mean? Well, <coughs> Al-Awwal means, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, Allahumma anta al-Awwal, O oh Allah, you are the first, there is nothing before you. And then, and then he said, O oh Allah, you are the last, there is nothing after you. Okay? How do you, most people worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his name that he's the first, but few people worship, his, worship him out of his name the last. Uh, when you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his name that he's the first, it means that you realize that you would have not reached there had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not decreed for you guidance before you even existed. I mean, that recognition that, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preceded, you know I'm saying, preceded you and preceded that guidance to you before you actually became guided, right, is to worship Allah in His name, that He's the first. And, and, and most, most people, they, they, can, they, they, can, they can understand that, and many people reach that. But to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by His name that He's the last, means that you realize, and I sort of touched on this last night in one of the questions when I talked about Allah's name as Samad, you realize that, that in every endeavor, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, should be the ultimate aim. And that any sort of endeavor, any sort of, any sort of, um, any sort of uh, inclination you have in your heart, or direction that you have in your heart, which is not aimed for Allah azza wa jal, it is, it's, it's a false inclination and will not bring any benefit to you. And, that, and that's just everything in life. I mean, you know, your heart, by nature, all living things, every single living thing is, 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 is um, driven by four, by four um, basic, uh, basic uh, emotions. Four, or four basic, um, uh, I don't want to say emotions, four basic, um, well, four basic something. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out a word for what to call it. Uh, the, the first is, is that, um, that, y- that you seek that which benefits you, and, you, and then you, and you try to find out the path to that which benefits you, and you seek to avoid that which harms you, causes you pain, and you try to find the path, avoid that path which brings you to that. Any living thing is, 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 is driven by those four uh, basic instincts, in, in every single thing, and even human beings, okay? So, you know, if you try to seek that which benefits you, and, and then you try to seek the path to which leads you to which benefits you, or you try to avoid that which harms you, and try to leave and, and the path which leads you to that, and this is why the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith that the most truthful names are, you know, Harith and Hammam. That, you know, the mo- because Harith means the one who cultivates, right? And so therefore he talks about taking that path, okay? And, and Hammam means the one who, uh, <coughs> who intends, and so therefore is that intention to, to that. Um, so when you understand that, so, you know, whenever you do something, you know, or you don't do anything because on purpose, you know, any sort of, any sort of voluntary, you know, emotion you have, it's because one of those four reasons. Either because you're trying to gain something or you're trying to avoid something. And so either because you know that thing is going to cause you pain or it's going to cause you benefit or that path will lead you to something painful or that path will lead you to something beneficial. I mean, that's all, and for every single thing. So if in, in the end of that, the inclination and the direction is not to Allah Azza wa Jal, then it will bring you no benefit in this world or hereafter. I mean, the only sa'i the only, only striving, which is to Allah, is the one which, which is reward and brought food in this world and the hereafter. Any sort of sa'i, any sort of striving, which is not to Allah, will not bring any benefit or any reward. And so, to worship Allah by His name Al-Akhir is, is just like you remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preceded you by creating you, and, and that He preceded you by giving you guidance before you were guided. Likewise, you understand that that any single emotion, any single direction you make must ultimately go to Allah Azza wa Jal, or otherwise it's of no value, and no benefit. And I'll be blameworthy to you, and you'll be condemned for it. And you will suffer for it also, in this world and in the hereafter. And to worship Allah, by yes, brother. Yes, I mean, to, to recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preceded you, I mean, in the sense that He created you and He existed before that, right? I mean, to understand His rubiya, right? And also to understand that, in terms of what we're talking in the spiritual sense, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for you guidance before you were guided. 
I mean, it's by his mercy. I mean, he, you know, he decreed for you to be guided, you know what I'm saying? And he wrote it, and as we'll talk about Qadr, you know what I'm saying, and wrote it and willed it before you were guided, before you were even born. I mean, before you were even something known. And so this is, this is Allah's, you know, this is why, I mean, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, he condemned the Bedouin Arabs when the Bedouin Arabs said to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, you know, that, you know, we have done you a favor by becoming Muslims. And the end of Surah Al-Hujarat, you know? What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? That don't say that, you know, you have done me a favor, right? But Allah has done a favor for you by guiding you to Islam. So, you know, and, and uh, even to say the word favor doesn't really express the, the Arabic, I mean, word, because the Arabic word, minna, you know what I'm saying? It means when you give somebody something and, you know, you give it to him and, and he is in a, a state where, you know, you give it to him and you show it to him that he's given it to him. It's a pure blessing and favor to him, which he has nothing, you know, I mean, didn't deserve it and, and so forth, you know. So it's a pure grifting, a, a gift and grant. So to worship Allah by his name, Allah, I mean, not just to recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's to recognize, I mean, to recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above us and so forth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, has, has encompassed the whole creation. And to worship Allah by his name, by al Ba'fin. I mean, as the Ibn al-Qayyim says, I mean, it's something which the tongues cannot describe, nor the pens can write. And it is a, it's a, it, but it, it comes to the point when you understand, as the Prophet ﷺ said, that there is none closer than you. Because the Prophet ﷺ explained in Ba'fan that there is none closer than you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to us than we are to our own selves. And that doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is intermingled with his creation, or that there is some sort of incarnation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to us than we are to our own selves. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows, he knows what we are thinking and what we, what we do before we even have thought it. You know what I'm saying? He knows the inner workings of our hearts and the motivations which sometimes we don't even realize ourselves. And so therefore we're surrounded by Allah. We're surrounded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in, in the sense of time, in the sense that he's before us and after us. And also in the sense of place, that he's above us and he's also, he, he knows what's within us and he's closer to us than our own selves. And if we say that, that ayah, if we say in Surah Al-Qaf, that the Nahnu here refers to Allah Azza wa Jal, yes. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala refers to the angels, and the angels are, you know, in part, uh, you know, writing, that they, they, they occupy uh, part of our uh, existence as the devil, that each one of us has a devil. Um, now, so, so that the third, the third level of being empowered before Allah is that that one um, that one uh, only achieves it when when one knows two principles that he knows that who, who Allah is and who He is, who He Himself as a human being is. When you know, you know who you are, who Allah is, you know as Allah has, has told us in the Quran and the Sunnah, and then you know who you are. And uh, then you can reach the third level of being impoverished before Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is an impoverishment which is such that, you know, that the, um, that your motivations and your, you know, existence is such that you recognize that no benefit and harm to you come, can only come from Allah Azza wa Jal. So you no longer see within the, um, in the causes and effects, you no longer see the causes which lead something to you. I mean, for instance, most of us, I'll give you an example, most of us, I mean, we think, and the way we act, right, is that if we attribute the, the cause of something, even if you were to ask a Muslim, if I was to say to you, well, who brings you your sustenance, right? You, everybody would say Allah. I mean, you know, nobody would, I mean, none of us, you know, would say, you know, I get my sustenance because of my job or something like that. I mean, all of us would, all of us would, would acknowledge verbally that we, it comes from Allah, I said, right? But yet, in our dealings and so forth, in the way we act, right, we act as if the sustenance is coming from our job. Okay, and so therefore we might not do something uh, that uh, to show our Islam, or we might, you know, do something sinful. You know what I'm saying? In order to uh, in, endear their their pleasure and so forth. So you know, you, you, but when you reach this third level, you 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 transgress that. You not transgress it, but you surpass that. So you no longer see these things. You see that only Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the one who's causing you benefit and harm. So therefore, you don't fear anything of the creation, and you have no reliance upon anything of the creation. Uh, so, all of us, if you ask them, when uh, somebody is taking some medication, who cures your body, all of us will say, Allah is the one who brings cure. But yet, at the same time, there's an attachment, and there's some sort of reliance in our heart to maybe the medication. But when you reach this level, you no longer see that. So, even though you take it, 
You know, even though you take the medication, and even though you work, right? But you realize that, and as a spiritual state, it's something which is not, um, it's not, it's not a mental recognition here, it's a spiritual state, you realize that the cure is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hand, and that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not decree for you the cure from those medications, you would not get it. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not decree for you, from, for you, your sustenance through that effort that you made at work, you would not get it. So, once it becomes a spiritual state, you reach this third level of being impoverished for Allah as well. And this, and this is the state... I mean, this is what leads a person to, you know, win, I mean, to, to become impoverished before Allah Azawajal, which is the first, or the first stage in traveling unto Allah Azawajal, is what allows us to win the blessing of seeing Allah in the hereafter. And this is what allows us to, to, to win the blessing of seeing Allah in the hereafter, uh, this spiritual, uh, great spiritual um, uh, blessing. Um, so I guess we have uh, about 15 minutes. Uh, I know that was a uh, sort of outside of the the, the course topics, but I, I, I thought it was appropriate to mention that. So. Um, as usual, we'll give priority to questions written down. Um, if we've got time after that, inshallah, we'll take questions from the floor. Um, the first question is, is it praiseworthy to seek for natural progress or promotion in, in your job, and is that counted as striving for the world? <coughs> yeah. Well, it depends on what's your the purpose of your that you work for. I mean, you know, if you use your job as a means to strengthen your worship of Allah as which I, I mean, in other words, if you say, well, you know, I work, and so therefore, if I have more financial independence, I can make Umrah more often. I can give more charity. I can, you know, support uh, Muslim causes. I can protect my family and, and provide for them. You know, what I'm saying in a better way. This is an act of worship. So to, to seek an increase in Allah's bounty is, 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 is praiseworthy in this, in this sense because you, you're seeking an increase in Allah's bounty in order to use that to worship Allah better, right? But if you seek increase in Allah's bounty and you seek progress in your job in order for you to raise your status in society or in order for you to increase in more wealth, then it's blameworthy because the Prophet ﷺ said that there are no two hungry wolves sent among a flock of sheep which can cause more destruction than a man's own craving for status and wealth, meaning to his religion. So, you know, so this is the hadith. So, I mean, it depends what's the motivation here. I mean, the motivation is to be able to worship Allah better, then it's okay. The motivation is to increase your status and wealth, then it's something which is blameworthy. Okay, alhamdulillah, we're getting a lot of questions, but I'm going to give priority to the topic, inshallah. Um, one from the sisters, is there not a hadith which states that you will see Allah as you imagine him? Please explain this, uh, um, please explain this, as you are not supposed to imagine Allah to the like of his creation. No, I'm not certain of a hadith which says, uh, you will see Allah as you imagine him. Um, but it is, you know, well... And you're not supposed to imagine Allah as which, yes, you're not, as we mentioned, as we studied in the Aqidah that Ibn Qudama said that you know, whatever concept or imagination you have of Allah, then know that Allah is not like that. So, I mean, however you imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is not like that. So, but as for the hadith, you will see Allah, if you, mean, if you mean by seeing Allah in the hereafter, you will see Allah uh, in the hereafter, as you imagine Him, that's not true. If you mean by seeing Allah in a dream, uh, then... Um, a person, um, if a person has a dream in which he sees Allah, the, the, um, the clarity of the dream will be according to the clarity of his faith. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of a tirmidhi that he saw Allah in a dream and he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best surah, in the best, in the best appearance. So, because the faith of the Prophet ﷺ is the most correct faith and the most clear faith. But if your faith has, if your iman has some sort of... Um, uh, weakness in it, or has some sort of confusion in your aqidah, then you might, in a dream, you know, see Allah, you might see a man, or you might see a cross, and so forth, and, you know, be deceived to that, because of, uh, if, you're a, if you're a mushrik, you know what I'm saying? And if you're a believer, you know, you might see something which is confused based upon that. So, I mean, I don't know if that's what the sister was, when she meant by seeing Allah, but that's what comes to mind. No, it's, it's not something specific for the Prophet Sarsal. So seeing Allah in the dream is not something specific to the Prophet Has someone ever seen Allah even uh, in the past, even including the angels? I think you just answered that question. No, uh, in terms of seeing Allah, uh, 
No, it is not interesting. Allah by one's eyesight, not not even the angels. But in terms of uh, a, a dream or something like that, then yes. But in terms of seeing Allah, so which none has seen Allah subhanahu wa taala. Um, in one of, in a hadith it states that when a believer believes uh, correctly, Allah will become the eyes with which he sees, the hearing with which he hears, and so on. Some people take this too literally. Please explain this hadith. Is it true that Allah can give uh, some people knowledge of the unseen? Well, yes. Um, uh, first of all, I mean, what, what, how does the hadith begin? The hadith says that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that my servant... Uh, does not draw close to me with something which I love more than that which I have obligated upon. And my servant continues to draw close to me with the voluntary acts until I love him. And when I love him, I become the eyes by which he sees and, 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 the, and the hearing by which he hears and the hand by which he reaches. And, and that's what the hadith mentions. It doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, becomes his eyes and his hearing and so forth. So Allah hears. But it means that, you know, that because he's reached this level of worship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects his him so that he therefore when he sees, he only sees by that, you know, which is pleasing to Allah. And when he hears, he only hears that which is pleasing to Allah. And when he walks, he only walks to that which is in obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he reaches out and he you know or, or withholds his hand, he only does so in that which is in obedience of Allah. Like Al Hassan al Basri said, you know, by Allah for I I, for, I said for twenty years or forty years, I have not spoken a word or withheld from speaking a word or taken a step forward or restrained myself without first thinking, is this, you know, in the pleasure of Allah or not? So when a person reaches this level of ihsan, you know what I'm saying, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved him in that sense. Um, can some people have knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give knowledge of the unseen? Um, you have to understand the unseen is two types. There's that which is known as, you know, the, the unseen, al ghayb al-Mutlaq, and there's also al ghayb al-Muqayyid. There's the, the, the absolute unseen which only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And then there is the relative unseen, which is unseen, but then becomes from the seen. So, for example, uh, if a person has a true dream, okay, you have a true dream that, oh, I had a dream that so-and-so will marry so-and-so, okay? That's something which, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it's a true dream, you then, and then so-and-so does marry so-and-so, right? So you were, you know, this was made uh, apparent to you. But this was from the unseen before it occurred. But once it occurred, it was no longer from the unseen. You see? All right? So, uh, and so, uh, in that sense, yes, I mean, some people can, you know, have knowledge of the future. Um, but it can also happen to unbelievers. I mean, it's not an indication of one's spiritual state. Because in Surah Yusuf, we find out that Pharaoh had a dream concerning the imminent um, um, famine which was going to occur in Egypt. But Fir'aun was, was an unbeliever. Pharaoh was an unbeliever. But he had a true dream. You know? It is said in, uh, in American history that um, uh, an Indian uh, chief, uh, one of the uh, soothsayers of the Indians, uh, when, the, when the first uh, uh, settlers came from Europe, he had a dream that, um, that a plague had come across all the Indian people and, uh, that night and that, he, that, that, and that would, and brought them all dead. And so he told the, uh, the chief of the, uh, of the Indians, this is the first Indian people, first contact with the Indians, the Europeans, he said, you know, the next morning he said, you know, kill them now. Put them to the sword because, you know, I had this dream and uh, that they were going to do so and so and so. But uh, the, the chief, that Indian of, the, of that Indian tribe, the, he decided to treat them well and gave them Manhattan or something like that. So, well, in the end, uh, it seems that, that the story is true, that that Indian... A uh, person who had the dream was true, because it became like a plague. I mean, the Indians, you know, and, um, American Indians basically have been wiped out, right? So, I mean, that's another example of an unbeliever, uh, if, if the story is true, of an unbeliever having a dream. So, having some knowledge of, of, the, of the unseen is not an indication of spiritual state. Likewise, when you, if you have a dream, you do not know that that dream you had is true until after the occurrences, right? I mean, let's say you went to sleep tonight and you had a dream that such and such occurred, Right? You don't know that's going to be true until that event occurs. Then you say, oh yes, I dreamt that this, and then so I knew that this dream was true, so this dream must have come from Allah. Azawajah. But before that an incident occurs, it could happen, it could not happen, right? And likewise, also, and the other important point to know is that even if you have a, a high spiritual state, it doesn't necessarily mean your interpretation of what happened is correct. Because one time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was his sunnah that he used to ask people, you know, especially after the Fajr prayer, who saw a dream that night? 
and people would tell him, and he would, and they would, he would interpret it from them. Okay, and so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Abu Bakr was sitting there. And Abu Bakr said, "Let me interpret the dream." So Abu Bakr interpreted the dream, and then he asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "How was my interpretation?" The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. In some of it you were correct, and some of it you were incorrect. So this was Abu Bakr who was a Siddiq. I mean, his, his, his Iman is so strong, he's known as a Siddiq. Okay? And he's the highest, as we'll find out in the Aqid as we continue on uh, tomorrow, that he's uh, the highest person in this Ummah after the Prophet Sallallahu And yet when he tried to interpret the unseen, in some of it he was correct, and in some of it he was incorrect. So it shows that not necessarily the dream interpretation is, is always wrong. I think it's... Uh, Now, it also happens in other, in other circumstances. I mean, a person might be given a, a word, you know what I'm saying? That he might, I mean, something, a word might be imbued into his, into his uh, heart about something. And, and you hear this often, I mean, even amongst the kufar, you know what I'm saying? I mean, a mother will all of a sudden, she, she will just get this sense that her child is in danger, and she'll run out, you know what I'm saying? And she'll pull out her child from the car hitting or some sort of, the child who's playing with a knife and so forth, and, and so forth. I mean, could that happen? Yes, because uh, each one of us uh, has an angel and has a jinn with him, okay? And, and so, therefore, uh, in the same way that the jinn whispers to you evil, right, uh, the angel can whisper to you good, all right? And so sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as his mercy to his creations, you know, might, you know, command the angel to whisper to a mother that, look, your child is in danger, so the mother also gets his premonition, she runs out of the house and she does something. Or she might hear a voice, you know, yeah, that's fine, but there's no, but by, by just that sensation, there's no way that you know when you feel that sensation, you know, is it, you know, did it come from the angel? Did it come from the devil? You know what I'm saying? Or did it just come from your own natural state? How can, how can you make that distinction? There's no way you can make that distinction. So, and same thing with a dream. You have a dream at night. You don't know if that dream came from Allah. You don't know if it came from the devil. You don't know if it just came from yourself. How can you, you know? Will the unbelievers uh, see Allah on the Day of Judgment? If yes, at what stage? Well, there's a difference of whether the unbelievers of, of opinion between the scholars whether the, the unbelievers will see Allah in the hereafter uh, a large section of the scholars say no based upon the ayah uh, which we mentioned from some of the that, that they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described that they were upon you know and Rabbihim mahjubun that they are veiled from their Lord but another group of scholars say the unbelievers will see Allah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word liqa okay and this word, which they usually translate in the English translations as meeting, according to the Arabic language, it is said that in the Arabic grammar, you cannot, you know, have a liqa with somebody unless you come face to face and you meet and you see him, okay? So, since Allah used that word saying that the people will meet their Lord, and the Arabic grammar implies that implication, so one group of scholars says the unbelievers will see Allah, as well, but there's a distinction here. They will see Allah in a state which will not be a state of bliss, but in a state of, 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 of punishment, okay? And they give an example. Just like the person who is being sent to the gallows, and he sees the hanged man. You see? Uh, you know, the, he, what is his feeling when he sees that person? I mean, he doesn't, it's, not, it's not a feeling of, you know, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of pleasure or bliss, but rather it's, a, 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 it's something which you wish you did not you know, seek, because, you know, that person is about to put you in the gallows and hang you, right? Or, in this case, you know, the doctor comes with a needle and, you know, and lethal injection. I guess you guys don't have a capital punishment here in England, right? So, uh, so. Well, in the United States, there is. Uh, just don't go to Texas and do anything, though. <laughs> String you up. So, the, the point is, is that, so, you know, the, uh, so that, that's, that's the point uh, regarding that. So, but this is a point of difference, and, and this really is an issue which, I mean, it doesn't bring much benefit in terms of its, uh, in terms of delving into it. I mean, you know, I mean, if one finds in the word liqa in the Arabic language that it has that implication, then alhamdulillah, if one doesn't find in the verb that it has that implication, then, you know, one doesn't have to. And it's one of the secondary points of aqidah, yes? Yes. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's for all the unbelievers. You see what I'm saying? I mean, that ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that whoever... Um, you know, goes against, um, you know, who turns away from, from his guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him ma'isha and banka, a, a strict life, which some says in this world, some says it refers to the grave, to the punishment of the grave. We'll raise him on the day of judgment blind. He will say, Oh Allah, why am I blind? You know what I'm saying? Well, so that doesn't, that's not necessarily that verse is applicable to all the kuffar. But it's a group of people who will be raised on the day of judgment blind. So, you know, it's just. It, it, so it doesn't mean necessarily that every single kafir will be raised the day of judgment blind. Well, 
right? That's for the hypocrites. Um, you know, the hypocrites, when... Uh, and the brother was asking about, because the sisters, they couldn't hear the question. The, the hypocrites, uh, the, the brother was asking about the, the eye in, in Surah Al-Hadid, where, where, uh, where they're asked to, to look, they're, they're looking for their light, and they'll say, go look behind you, and then a barrier will be placed between them. That's talking about the hypocrites, because the believers and the hypocrites will be together. Okay, on the stand. And all those people who, who worship different deities will have been led with their deities, you know, into the hellfire. So those who worship the idols, the idols will come and appear with them and lead them into the hellfire, and the Christians will follow, you know, a, an appearance of the devil, which will appear in the, in the, in the, in the form of Jesus, and, and so forth. Now, the hypocrites, who apparently in this world were with the believers, right, will be with intermingled with the believers. When it comes time to cross over the sirat, over the bridge, okay? I mean, what, what leads you over this bridge, which is as long as the hellfire, and yet is as sharp as a sword's edge and as thin as a strand? I mean, you know, hair of hair. I mean, typically, you know, if you try to, you know, walk on uh, a plank, you know what I'm saying, which is maybe six inches or ten inches wide, and, and, and there was no lights, you would fall, because you wouldn't be able to know where you're, where you're, where you're, where you're to place your foot. So how much more so when, when, when it's over the hellfire and it's so thin and so sharp, right? The light of your iman will lead you, you see? And so that's why some people will have, because of their iman being weak, they will only have light as, as, as if it's just like something glowing, like an ember. So they'll crawl, because it's all they, they can see and just lead them over. They'll crawl over this thing. But other people who have much good deeds will pass over it. One cross says them says that like the blinking of an eye, others like the flashing of lightning, others like a strong wind, and so forth. So the hypocrites, when they, when they come time to cross, and they'll say, well, where, where is our light? Okay? The believers will say to them, you know what I'm saying, go get your light. So then a barrier will be placed between them. See? And so here, the, the true faith comes out from that, that hypocritical faith. And so then the barrier comes to them, and, and they're sent to the hellfire. So this is, this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deceiving the hypocrites, just like they try to deceive Allah as well as in this world, and how they try to deceive the believers. So Allah will deceive them until the last moment, you see. And so they'll think that, they'll think that they're going to go along, and yeah, they're moving it along, and then you see this will happen to them, the deception will happen to them. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve us from hypocrisy. Could you please repeat point 44, which part of the hadith was weak? The, the, the hadith that says, uh, while the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever recites the Qur'an and expresses it clearly, he has with each letter uh, recited from it ten good deeds, and whoever recites it and mispronounces it, he has with each letter a single good deed. Uh, that hadith in, in, in totality is weak. No, I mean, the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, that, that the one who is, you know, um, proficient in reciting the Qur'an that he's with the angels. And the one who, you know, it's a hatta, that he's, he struggles in reciting it, that he will have two rewards, right? But this hadith says that, if, you know, the, the other hadith says that for every, you know, letter you recite the Qur'an, you have ten rewards. I do not say alif, lam, mim is a single letter, but alif is a letter, lam is a letter, mim is a letter. That, those, those are two correct hadith, but, but this hadith that if you recite the Qur'an, and let's say a word has five letters, and you recite it correctly, and you get ten rewards for each letter. But if you cite it, you know, you have problems because you, you, you mispronounce it, so you get one. That, that, that's a weak hadith. The Mu'tazila deny the vision on the basis that you cannot see Allah in a direction. They use the verse, no vision can grasp him. Uh, grasp him. They also deny the vision on the basis of the statement addressed to Prophet Musa, alayhi salam, saying, you cannot see me. They say, lan, in lan talani means, negation of Musa seeing Allah. Please disprove their arguments. Well, yes, I mean... Uh, I think the, the, the question is, is confusing here, the Esha'aris and the Martezina, but it's, it's, nonetheless, we can um, come to the point. Uh, because direction, the issue, the argument of direction is, is basically an Esha'ari direction. I mean, they say you see Allah, but not in a direction, so... But the Martezina, they deny that you can see Allah. And they use two Quranic ayat in order to support their point. The point is as believers, right? When we have this verse from the Quran that says on the day of judgment people will, their faces will be radiant looking unto their Lord. And when the Prophet ﷺ says that each one of you will see Allah as, or that you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you see the moon in its clarity, right? You will not have to gather together. Then we should accept these ayat and we should know that the Quran is not going to and, the, and we accept the ayat and the hadith and we know that the Quran and the hadith are not going to contradict, right? And if we can't put it together, what is our position? 
Huh? We accept it all. So we, we, we just we say we accept it all. This is true and that is true. You know, we, we don't understand how they come together because that's, yeah, that's, that's the path we're supposed to take. But how do we understand it? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لَا تُدْرِكُهُ الْأَفْصَارِ which the brother translated, no vision can grasp him. And idrak in the Arabic language, from the word tudriku, the verb comes from, uh, doesn't mean, it, well, in, in, the word grasp sort of tries to imply that, but it means to encompass. Encompass, okay? So, you know, to see something is different than to encompass something in insight. I mean, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, is, 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 is so great. Uh, he's Allahu, that's why we say Allahu Akbar, that, that you cannot... You cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as, as he deserves. I mean, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that there is not a single hand span in the heavens except that there is an angel either standing in prayer or bowing or prostrating. They have been that from the beginning of the creation until the day of judgment. And when the horn is blown, they will say, Oh Allah, we have not worshipped you as you deserve. Okay. You cannot praise Allah as, as, he can, as he is to be praised. For that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the du'a, which we say during Witsan, right? لا نحسك ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك. You, we cannot praise you as you deserve. You are, you are only as you have praised yourself. Okay. You cannot fear Allah subhanahu wa taala as He deserves. You cannot repent to Allah subhanahu wa taala as He deserves. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa taala is so great, you cannot encompass Him in knowledge. Just the one of the ayat we took earlier. ولا يحيطون به علما that they do not encompass him in knowledge. And likewise, when we see Allah on the Day of Judgment, Allah is so great, we will not be able to encompass Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in sight. And so the verse, La tudrikul afsa, is, 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 is still valid in, 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 in that context. I mean, there's no contradiction between that and seeing Allah in the hereafter. In the same way that, you know, there's, I mean, when you look in, in, the, in the sky above you in the nighttime, right? I mean, there's no way you can see the whole sky. You look in one direction, and you have to turn your head, because you cannot grasp the whole sky with your eyesight, okay? So... And yet, we know that the, the heavens is, is, is very small in, in, in compared, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that his kursi, right, which is above, which is before his throne, uh, uh, is, is, is wide, you know, as the heavens and the earth. And yet his kursi concerned to his throne, the Prophet ﷺ said, is that if you take a ring and you cast it in the desert. And the throne is so large that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can measure it. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than that, because the whole creation in his hand is like a mustard seed in one of our hands. So how could you encompass Allah as well in, in, in sight? As far as the, uh, the statement of, uh, that Allah said to Musa, Alan tarani, you will not be able to see me, meaning in this world. Because had it been impossible to see Allah in this world and also in the hereafter, then Musa, alayhi salam, which is a prophet of Allah, and not just any prophet of Allah, but one of the five messengers of Allah, ul al-Azm, and one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised above the other messengers in the sense that Allah spoke to him directly, right? Yet, he, would he not know that? I mean, why would he ask Allah to see him if it was an impossibility? So it is possible to see Allah, but as the Prophet said, no, none of you will see your Lord until he dies. So it's something which, as, so, Len Tarani, you will not see me, meaning in this world, not meaning in the hereafter. Uh, just two more questions, inshallah, so that we can have a quick break between now and the next lecture. Um, you said that it's all very well to read these lecture notes but we will not really benefit until we make it part of our character. What are your suggestions for incorporating this new knowledge into our practical daily lives? I mean, we're studying matters of aqidah, so I mean, the point is, is that if one has a misunderstanding in his aqidah, then by learning this, he's correcting that misunderstanding. So that, that's one way to incorporate this new knowledge. The other thing is we learn certain principles which are beneficial, I mean, in general. I mean, in the sense that for instance, that we know that if we, misunder- we don't understand something in the Qur'an or in the Sunnah, we still we should accept it and believe it and not try to delve into it. That's something which is beneficial for us. The fact that we should submit to the Qur'an, to what Allah tells us in the Qur'an and what in the Sunnah, that's beneficial for us. But in the end, I mean, I would hope that when we understand this aqidah, we should increase in love of Allah, increase, because our knowledge of Allah has increased, we should increase of fear of Allah, we should increase of our hope for Allah's mercy, uh, as, as we'll go into the thing. I mean, to know that, for instance, that the Qur'an is the literal words of Allah. I mean, when one understands this. And now he should approach the Qur'an, you know, he or she should approach the Qur'an thinking about it, that, well, yes, these are the words of Allah, and this is Allah spoke these words. And so he should have a reverence and, and awe coming to the Qur'an, which would uh, impact the way he reads and the way he understands and the way he applies it. Likewise, when you know that, you know, this is a great blessing to see Allah in the hereafter, you should strive 
in order to win this blessing and not be amongst those people who have been, you know, who will be veiled from Allah on the Day of Judgment. Uh, likewise, when you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above you, your heart should then, you know, be directed up when you worship Allah Azza wa Jal and, and, and so forth and so on. So, I mean, in, in this way we can draw, you know, benefits uh, from what we've learned. On point number 46, you mentioned that you mentioned the statement that we will visit Allah is weak. How can we reconciliate with that, uh, with that with the hadith that the believers will visit Allah every Friday in Jannah then return to their families? <coughs> yes, I mean, that, 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 uh, I don't know how we're going to reconcile this. I mean, there is a hadith that says that the, the, the male believers will come on every Friday. So, I mean, when, they, when the, uh, the commentator on the printed edition um, of this book uh, you know, he said the hadith was weak, that they will visit him. I mean, why didn't he, you know, reconcile it with this hadith? I had the same question in my mind, so, that, you know, uh, so as to how to reconcile it. So, you know, maybe, maybe this hadith, he also considers it to be weak or not. But that's something which we need to, you know, uh, into, to investigate into. Yes. Okay, so, so I mean, so what is it? I mean, what are they thinking? A lot is delineated in the sixth direction. I mean, I mean what? what? No, I know they don't understand the contrary, but I, I mean, I don't re recollect, I don't personally recollect what, what it is is that they, that they find objectionable. But the point is, is that, I mean, that we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, unless they find it objectionable because, well, I mean, even the, I, don't, I don't know what their argument is, but the point is, is that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, you know, the highway says in his creed, you know, he's not delineated by the six directions. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater and he encompasses the creation. I mean, up and down and left and right and front and back, okay, which is the six directions, okay, is only in reference to two created beings. It's only in reference to three beings. This brother is in front of me, this brother is to my right, this brother is to my left, the wall is behind me, the floor is underneath me, the roof is on top of me. These are in reference to all created beings, right? But the whole creation, the whole creation, the heavens and the earth and the angels and everything, I mean, is in Allah's hand like a mustard seed in one of our hands. So, I mean, there's no comparison here. So the, the issue of directions here is not even applicable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, that's it for now, inshallah. Um, we will try our best to get all the questions answered by the end of the course. So, if it hasn't been answered now, then inshallah it will be. Um, the next lecture is at 3.30 which is in 15 minutes time, so please can we try to be back on time for that one.